Bill Fenton, Director of Research and Public Programs at the Library Company of Philadelphia. The Library Company, as I'm sure you all well know, was founded by Benjamin Franklin back in 1731, but today we are an independent research library with wonderful specializations in all things early America, early Americana, that includes print and visual culture, book history. Um, we have specializations in African American history, women's history, political economy, and business history. Um, and our, you know, sort of crown jewel, of course, is our fellowship program, which has really helped us to sustain this particular series. I started this a little over a year ago with the anticipation that our fireside chats would provide a little bit of normalcy and a little bit of reprieve for myself from just staring at Zoom uh, and, 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 and meeting and instead sort of have an enriching experience where I could learn about fantastic scholarship that's emerging from our collections. And I didn't anticipate to be more than a monthly series, but thanks to the generosity of our learning community, uh, we've been able to keep it going for the entire year and then some uh, on a weekly basis. So I'm really grateful for that. And um, for all of you that might be new to this format, it's a little different from your typical Zoom. Your camera, your audio, they are disabled by design. Uh, we figured that you can use a little break at seven o'clock on a Thursday night. We're now into spring. You might be uh, setting this up on a patio or something. So I want you to feel very comfortable uh, to listen in or watch or however you're experiencing this. And of course, we always make these available after the fact uh, via our YouTube channel and our SoundCloud feed. Um, and we have a follow-up email that will provide that link in case you wanna share this with anyone who maybe didn't have an opportunity to participate. Um, of course, we do want you to participate in this event. And the best way to do that is through the Q&A function. You can throw me a curveball and put things in chat, but my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. And um, I would say that the best way to ensure that I actually get to your questions in that last 15 minutes that we always set aside for Q&A would be to put it in the Q&A thread and I'll work through them sequentially. So the sooner you get your question in, the greater the likelihood I will ask your wonderful question. Um, so with all of that sort of housekeeping set aside, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker tonight. Uh, Amanda Bellows is a historian of the United States in comparative and transnational perspective. She received her PhD in history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today, she is a lecturer at the New School in Huntington College in New York City. Her first book is the subject of tonight's fireside chat, American Slavery and Russian Serfdom in the Post-Emancipation Imagination was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2020. Her writings have appeared in the Journal of Global Slavery, the New York Times, whew, the Washington Post, whew, Talking Points Memo, and Public Seminar. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. Um, I guess uh, I'll start by sharing um, my slides for the presentation. So here we go. All right. So yes, my name is Amanda Bellows and Will, I wanted to thank you so much for having me on your program. These Library Company of Philadelphia Fireside Chats have been such a wonderful way to bring people together during the past year. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking with everyone and I welcome your questions and comments. Tonight, we are going to discuss American slavery, Russian serfdom, and the 50 years that followed the emancipation of enslaved African-Americans and Russian serfs. During this tumultuous period, Americans and Russians of diverse backgrounds responded to the abolition of slavery and serfdom through cultural production in poetry, fiction, drama, lithographs, oil paintings, advertisements, photographs, and so much more. In these media, um, we have authors and artists representing slavery and serfdom, as well as peasants and African-American free people in striking and often surprising ways. So my book, American Slavery and Russian Serfdom in the Post-Emancipation Imagination, investigates these varied portrayals, searching for points of comparison and divergence 
I argue that these mass oriented depictions had a widespread impact. They shaped collective memories of slavery and serfdom, uh, affected how people conceived of their national identities and influenced public opinion as peasants and freed people sought to um, exercise their newfound rights. Before we dive into some of these research findings and analyze images together, uh, I wanted to begin by providing an overview of American slavery and Russian serfdom and emancipation in both countries, since I think the historical context will inform our interpretation of representations from the post-emancipation era. So here we go. American slavery and Russian serfdom were two contemporaneous systems of forced labor. They began in the 1600s and they ended in the 1860s. Serfdom formally started in 1649 when Russia's czar, pictured here, Alexei Mikhailovich, and his government passed the Saborne Ulogenia or the Law Code of 1949. It bound peasants to the land upon which they worked land that was owned by members of the aristocracy or by the state. The enserved peasantry composed a significant majority of the population in Russia, approximately 80% by the 1860s. During the centuries that followed the passage of the law code of 1649, serfs labored endlessly while possessing uh, just few rights. They paid rent to the Russian nobility, their landlords, uh, with whom they shared the same ethnicity, language, and Russian Orthodox religion. Landlords exerted almost total control over serfs. Members of the nobility could physically abuse serfs or whip them. They could sell their land and with them their serfs. They could force serfs into military service something akin to a life sentence that would take them away from their homes and their families for years or even decades. Landowners could refuse serfs permission to marry the man or woman of their choice, or they could even exile serfs to somewhere like Siberia as punishment for even an accusation of wrongdoing. As in the United States, Russian landlords could and did sexually abuse or even rape their serfs. They had few means of resistance uh, in a country that didn't recognize their lawsuits against members of the nobility. Thousands of serfs though did resist these oppressive restrictions. They would run away to Russia's distant borderlands or they even revolted against their owners during the 18th and 19th centuries. Here we have a photograph of Russia's czar Alexander II uh, who abolished serfdom in 1861 by issuing an Emancipation Manifesto that freed 40% of Russia's population from servitude. He did so in part because of Russia's defeat in the Crimean War. This was an international conflict lasting from 1853 to 1856. Russia's loss in the war inspired Tsar Alexander II and his advisors to contemplate and enact significant societal reforms, including the abolition of serfdom as a way of modernizing their nation. The military was a particular area of concern for government officials because it was composed primarily of conscripted peasants who didn't exactly make up the most effective professional fighting source. Most Russian aristocrats, these landowners, they hoped to preserve serfdom because they thought that the institution of serfdom was durable and because serf labor provided them with an income to support their heavy expenses. They saw though that they couldn't prevent Tsar Alexander II from abolishing serfdom. So in fact, many nobles actually helped draft the terms of the emancipatory legislation. And they did so in order to help minimize their losses. But sorry, come back. Um, between 1857 and 1861, there were these government commit, uh, committees uh, com comprising officials and members of the nobility. Um, and they crafted the terms of emancipation that would define the next 50 years, this post emancipation era in Russia. In 1861, uh, when Tsar Alexander II issued his Emancipation Manifesto, the serfs 
legal status um, immediately changes from serfs to free rural inhabitants. Now these peasants gained important new rights and freedoms. Now they couldn't be sold against their will or moved from a state to a state. They could create contracts, initiate lawsuits, marry whomever they chose. Um, in 1863, the government issued charters that allowed peasants to purchase household allotments of land. But in exchange for permanent use of the land, the peasants were required to make redemption payments um, over the course of 49 years to the, um, the owners of the estates. And the fiscal burden of these redemption payments was very high and it effectively bound the peasants to the land in a situation that was similar to that um, in the American South where freed people in the system of sharecropping were similarly um, had very little mobility. For decades after abolition, peasants largely remained in place uh, as the communes responsible for collecting these payments didn't let the peasants leave if they hadn't fulfilled their debts. So peasants made these redemption payments until the 1905 revolution when the next, uh, well, uh, there were two czars after Alexander II, but the second to next czar, uh, Czar Nicholas II, canceled the outstanding payments and taxes and permitted peasants to move freely about the country. Now, slavery in British North America uh, began just 30 years before serfdom in Russia. But the circumstances in British North America were quite different um, from those of Russia. The first enslaved Africans who reached the British colonies in mainland North America came from West Africa, where they spoke Kimbundu, a Bantu language, and practiced farming and raised livestock. They were captured by Portuguese slave traders and shipped across the Atlantic Ocean on uh, a vessel that was bound for Mexico that never reached its destination. This ship was but one of thousands that transported millions of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean during the transatlantic slave trade. Now two English privateers, two English ships intercepted the Portuguese slave ship on its route. The English sailors captured 50 or 60 African men and women and brought them to the young colony of Jamestown, Virginia. According to the British colonist, John Rolfe, these sailors sold the enslaved Africans to the colonists at quote, the best and easiest rates they could, quote. Between 1525 and 1866, 12 million Africans were captured and sold into slavery with approximately 2 million dying during the terrible journey that became known as the Middle Passage. 10 million enslaved Africans reached uh, North America, South America, and the Caribbean. Scholar Henry Louis Gates Jr. estimates that about 388,000 enslaved Africans reached North America. In the United States, the slave trade rapidly expanded during the 17th and 18th centuries. On the eve of the Civil War in 1861, the enslaved population in the United States had significantly grown. There were now 4 million enslaved African Americans with a property value in the billions of dollars. Slavery initially pervaded the United States, but became concentrated in the American South where the enslaved population, um, with the enslaved African-Americans comprised 33% of the total population. Enslaved people worked from dawn until dusk, planting or harvesting or working in households on domestic tasks. Slavery was utterly dehumanizing. Enslaved people were considered by their white owners to be human property and were treated like chattel. Slaveholders beat or whipped enslaved people, sexually assaulted them or raped them. And as in Russia, enslaved people had almost no legal recourse against their owners. They lacked status as citizens of the United States. Many resisted their enslavement by breaking tools, refusing to complete orders, running away, or through violent rebellion. Self-liberated African-Americans 
face the horrific prospect of capture and punishment, however, um, even if um, others succeeded in escaping from their enslavement. Many uh, hoped to join free African uh, American communities in the US North, where um, there were communities in cities like Philadelphia, where people formed families freely, founded newspapers and churches, uh, and, led to, and led the growing abolitionist movement during the early 19th century in an effort to permanently end slavery in the United States. In this rare image from the Library Company of Philadelphia, we see uh, an African-American couple in New York City in 1832. The observer, Francis Trollope, described these individuals um, as part of his larger discussion about the free black community in New York. He wrote that the young lady was dressed, quote, in the extreme of fashion and accompanied by a black bow whose toilet was equally studied. Eyeglass, guard chin, nothing was omitted. He walked beside his sable goddess uncovered and with an air of the most tender devotion. Decades of anti-slavery activism on the part of black and white abolitionists preceded the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. When the war began, there were 4 million enslaved Africans in the United States, making up about 13% of the total population. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued an Emancipation Proclamation that freed enslaved African Americans in the Confederacy and permitted black enlistment in the Union Army. The Civil War's end in 1865 led uh, to the ratification of the 13th Amendment in December of that year, which permanently abolished slavery in the United States, except as punishment for uh, crime. After abolition, freed people strove to exercise their newly acquired rights. They searched for family members from whom they'd been separated during the antebellum period due to the domestic slave trade. They also built new lives for themselves by gaining paid employment, establishing educational institutions like schools and universities, and they formed churches, community organizations, and political groups. Now they did so in the face of anti-Black racism and white supremacist violence during the post-emancipation era. The gains achieved during the period of reconstruction which lasted from 1865 to 1877 and included acquiring citizenship and franchise for black men were challenged in the Jim Crow era that followed in the late 19th century. States passed discriminatory legislation that denied rights to African-Americans. White supremacists enacted campaigns of violence to enforce racial subjugation and the Supreme Court ruled that segregation was constitutional in Plessy versus Ferguson case of 1896. Although 1500 African-Americans held political office during reconstruction, white supremacist violence and the passage of laws restricting black Americans ability to vote curtailed their political power and voices. In my book, I wanted to understand how Russians and Americans responded to these massive societal changes through cultural production. It was a big project, one that required locating and categorizing the huge range of images uh, and representations of American slavery and Russian serfdom that were produced between 1861 and 1915. So this slide shows some of my central research questions as I approached the topic. How did Americans and Russians of diverse backgrounds portray African Americans and Russian peasants after emancipation? How did different audiences respond to these representations? To what extent did factors like perceived racial and ethnic differences, political power, and economic status shape portrayals and popular responses to them? What do these depictions tell us about how societies with systems of bonded labor respond to social transformation and changing power dynamics. 
Each chapter of the book considers representations of slavery, serfdom, in the aftermath of emancipation in a different medium, literature, illustrated periodicals and lithographs, oil paintings and advertisements. And here's just a brief chapter outline. After emancipation, a wide range of depictions of African-Americans and Russian peasants circulated in both countries. I categorized and analyzed these images looking for similarities and differences. On this slide, I've highlighted some of my findings. Striking similarities emerged across a range of representations. We see in both countries how American and Russian landowning elites produce nostalgic images of slavery and serfdom that showed their resistance to their loss of power, wealth, and stature. Next, upper and middle-class Americans and Russians portrayed free people and peasants who had left behind the plantations and estates of former owners for urban settings. In this new liberated context, they are represented as violent perpetrators of disorder, particularly in mass-oriented lip crafts and cartoons. In advertisements, American and Russian businesses most often deployed images of African Americans and peasants in positions of servitude to sell products to white and non-peasant consumers. Some of these ads used highly racist and violent imagery at a time when white supremacist violence and, and episodes of lynching devastated the country. Finally, I found that African Americans and Russian peasants challenged nostalgic, racist, and one-dimensional depictions by producing dignified self-representations in a variety of media. Stark differences also emerged from this comparison. Racism played a central role in shaping white representations of African-Americans, but conceptions of racial difference were largely, though not entirely absent in depictions of Russian peasants. Russian peasants also appeared in a broader range of portrayals, um, including as representatives of Slavic culture or as egalitarian city dwellers. Let's look together now at a series of representative images from a range of sources. I'm happy to answer further questions about them or to return to any of them during our Q&A. In the first category, we have nostalgic representations of African Americans and Russian peasants. Now, these were typically idealized, sentimental visions of slavery and serfdom that whitewashed the brutal nature of these systems of forced labor. One of the most common 19th century representations of enslaved African Americans was that of the Mammy figure, a Black nurse who appeared as devoted to the children of her white owner. Here on the left, you can see an untitled illustration from a 19th century periodical depicting an African-American woman taking care of two white children. Although this image contained no text in the archive where I found it at the New York Historical Society, um, it might interest you to hear words from an idealistic article that was published in Frank Leslie's Weekly in 1893. This article talks about the notion of the mammy figure in the late 19th century. The white author of the article writes that the so-called mammy was, quote, the nursery chief and assistant housekeeper, quote, on Southern plantations. He continued, she was an important member of the household, held in high esteem by all, and especially regarded by the children, to whom she was something like a second mother, quote, According to the author, the mammy's role as the family's moral compass extended into the children's adulthood. On any occasion, the author claimed, quote, whether it be a picnic in the woods, a ball at a neighboring manor house, a wedding, a christening, a sickbed, a funeral, the mammy is there full of sympathy, interest, and attention, quote. In the American context, uh, context the image of the mammy figure appeared most frequently in the post-emancipation era, when white Americans sought to portray African Americans, either as enslaved people or as free people, as dedicated to whites and as content in subservient social positions. On the right uh, side of the slide, you can see a very similar retrospective image that was produced in a popular Russian illustrated journal. 
And here we have a child uh, who was the former serf owned by the Russian nobleman depicted. And she's fanning him uh, as he reads his morning newspaper. Like the mammy figure in the image on the left, uh, this Russian serf child represents the loyal uh, former serf, the peasant who refuses to leave the estate. Now there was text that accompanied this image, uh, which said that the Russian artist had, quote, faithfully reproduced the type of the old master, quote. The artist is um, openly sympathetic to the landowner, not the child peasant who, quote, drives away the flies while he, the nobleman, complacently slumbers over his newspaper, uh, something that they describe, uh, the author describes as a luxury to which he was accustomed and could not part with after the peasant reforms of 1861. The author even argued that, quote, there is nothing more difficult in later years than to abandon the habits developed by one's entire life, quote. I think that's a phrase that um, is delicately encouraging the viewer to adopt a sympathetic um, perspective of the elderly man. Next, we will move to two scenes of urban disorder. Both Russian, Amer Russian and American cities expanded rapidly at the turn of the 20th century as peasants and freed people with newfound mobility moved to cities where job opportunities abounded thanks to industrialization. There, they competed for wage paying positions in factories and manufacturing companies. In periodicals and lithographs produced by non-peasants and by whites, we see images of peasants and African-Americans as perpetrators of urban disorder. These representations reflect their discomfort with the notion of peasant bondage and black independence outside of the system of servitude, of slavery. The first image uh, here appeared in a satirical Russian journal and shows two peasants brawling on a city street. The idea uh, in this image is if the peasants are on the estate, they're under control. And if they're liberated, they are a problem. By contrast, uh, we have two images here created by Courier and Ives in 1884. On the left, uh, we have an image called It's a Sure Thing, uh, in which we see a group of African-American men smoking cigars as they prepare uh, for a dog fight. On the right, you can see um, the subsequent lithograph all broke up that reveals the bloody aftermath of this event. Such illustrations help substantiate the stereotype of African-American men as violent criminals during this period. Now the literature of this era also sought to support this stereotype of black men as criminals. Um, I found uh, an article written by the former New York police commissioner, uh, William McAdoo. He wrote about urban African-Americans in Harper's Weekly in 1906. He argued that, quote, one of the most troublesome and dangerous characters with which the police have to deal is the tenderloin type of Negro, quote, and he continues, quote, an overdressed, flashy, bejeweled loafer, gambler, and in many instances, general criminal, quote. The police commissioner described African-Americans as men who lurked about while, quote, heavily armed, generally carrying, in addition to the indispensable revolver, a razor, quote, weapons they used, he argued, with deadly effect. Together, uh, I think images and then texts like this one created racist portraits of black urban residents as lawbreakers and as gangsters. A third type of representation was that of Russian and African-American uh, folk culture, so to speak. In an era of urbanization and industrialization, Russian and American ethnographers became increasingly concerned about the decline of cultural traditions among the peasantry and African-Americans. Illustrations of folk culture in Russian periodicals coincided with a period of increasing national interest in Russia's historic traditions. Dramatic images like this one, uh, Christmas time in the village, portrayed costumed peasants celebrating holidays in rituals that combined pre-Christian and Russian Orthodox traditions. 
white Americans were similarly interested in the folk traditions of African Americans. But by contrast, they did not see such traditions as fully representative of what they believed, uh, what they perceived to be American heritage. In this image produced by Harper's Weekly in 1876, we see a white couple uh, exploring the grounds of a plantation here on the side. Uh, an African-American man plays his banjo, an instrument with African roots, while children dance around him. Images like this one promoted an idealized vision of slavery, uh, one that urban middle-class readers may have been drawn to in part because they offered uh, an appealing alternative to post-emancipation urban conditions defined by labor competition, political strife, um, and tense relations between black and white workers. Representations of African-Americans and Russian peasants also frequently appeared in advertisements. Illustrated ads grew rapidly in the late 19th century when in the United States, private companies advertising spending grew from 30 million in 1880 to 600 million in 1910. Most American businesses uh, were owned and operated by white Americans at, in this period who used images of African-Americans to sell products to the white consumers who made up a majority of their consumer base. Racist advertisements depicting African-Americans were extremely common during the late 19th century. One of the most prevalent images was that of the subservient, uh, the submissive black servant, typically an enslaved person or a freed person uh, whose status was perhaps ambiguous, uh, who maintained an unwavering loyalty to their white employer or owner. Here we have a trade card for Boston-based Chase and Sanborn's Seal brand uh, mocha. The slogan for the product is, quote, aristocratic coffee of America, quote. On the front of the card, uh, an elderly man speaks admiringly about the brand of coffee referring to his so-called mistress in dialect, as he says, quote, my missus says there's no good coffee in these parts. Spect she'll change her mind when she drinks seal brand. Other advertisements presented scenes of violence against black Americans masqueraded as humor. For instance, here is a trade card for Seneca Falls based company, uh, Rumsey and Company's Pumps. We see a racist caricature of an African-American couple sitting on a fence as they prepare to slice open a watermelon. Text below the image, however, threatening alludes to the broader tradition of violence against African-Americans. And the caption reads, we'll cut you deep. Russian peasants also appeared as servants of the aristocracy in late 19th century advertisements. Here we have an advertisement for folk tea. A peasant uh, dressed in traditional folk costume here in the center serves tea uh, to a family. She displays her subservient position, however, through her posture and her status as a serf or as a freed peasant is deliberately vague. Um, but the allusions to an idealized vision of serfdom are clear. Unlike American advertisers, Russian businesses were more willing to depict peasants as equals to the merchants, businessmen, and even aristocrats of the era. Uh, and I have two ads to show you. The first um, is a very egalitarian advertisement for beer. And the slogan here reads, uh, pleases everyone's taste. So you can see um, uh, two different urban peasants and then uh, other members of other different estates, including this um, aristocrat, all drinking um, the same beer. So in my book, I argue that these types of egalitarian advertisements um, occurred for an interesting reason. Peasants made up a demographic majority in Russia so it's likely um, that Russian businesses wanted to tap their growing purchasing power at the turn of the 20th century. And they courted these peasant consumers through democratic images like these. 
As a second example, here we have an advertisement for cigarettes. Um, and you can see an urban peasant in a red shirt standing at the front of a crowd of city dwellers from different classes, um, including you know, several aristocrats in their top hats. And the peasant is reading. Um, that's notable because many generations of peasants before this man wouldn't have had an opportunity to go to school and gain an education. But now that serfdom is over and peasant schools have been established, he is able to read and participate as a consumer. African Americans and Russian peasants challenged portrayals of non-peasants and white Americans by producing striking self-representations that showed viewers uh, their communities, their traditions, and their aspirations. They sought to challenge these racist or one-dimensional or stereotypical images that were most prevalent at the time. Now here we have a painting by Henry uh, Osawa Tanner. Tanner studied at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia, and then at the Académie Julien in Paris. His most famous African-American genre painting, The Banjo Lesson from 1893, celebrates the transmission of musical knowledge from a grandfather to his grandson. It is a sober, intimate portrait of a loving relationship between these two people one that sharply contrasted with the stereotypical late 19th century images of comic black minstrel figures. By comparison, the peasant artist Vasily Maximov was one of a distinguished group of painters known as the Wanderers, the Paradvizhniki. Maximov left the countryside to receive training in icon painting and to study at the Imperial Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg. Because of his family heritage, Maximov was able to share the traditions, religious practices, and rituals of the peasantry with his audiences. In this painting, we see the artist's portrayal of a very dramatic moment when a magician, shown here, arrives at a wedding of these two people inside of a peasant's uh, humble home. Next, we have a calendar produced by Ivan Sisian, a prolific publisher from the peasant estate who portrayed a group of peasants here learning how to read. As I mentioned, peasant schools were established in significant numbers after the abolition of serfdom. And here we have a very dignified portrait of Sisian. Sisian's portrait is similar to that of the artist Henry Jackson Lewis. Lewis worked for the black owned and operated illustrated periodical, the Indianapolis Freeman. It was founded by Edward Cooper, a native of Tennessee. Now Lewis, uh, shown here, was a self-taught engraver and a cartoonist. Here we see the instruments of his work, his tools before him. Uh, in this patriotic image, you can also see an eagle overhead, perhaps emphasizing his status as a citizen and the prosperous city in which he resides behind him as well. Finally, we also can see here um, a series of portraits from the Colored American Magazine, which ran from 1900 to 1909. Founded by Boston's Colored Cooperative Publishing Company, it had a circulation of 17,000 at its height making it the most widely distributed illustrated African-American magazine of the period. The Colored American magazine often placed photographs such as these of African-Americans in between different stories, giving readers a glimpse of the broader community of African-Americans across the nation. Here we see an upper middle-class woman, Mrs. Johnston, who lived in Pueblo, Colorado in the American West. African-Americans migrated to the West in the late 19th century in search of more land and freedom from the oppressive Jim Crow South. Mrs. Johnston is dressed in the latest fashion. She's wearing an elegant dress uh, and sparkling earrings. So another uh, beautiful example of self-representation here. Uh, well, I think this is a good place to stop um, and get the conversation going. So I'm ready to answer questions, um, Will, if you think everyone is ready. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and all of you can uh, 
submit your questions to the Q&A thread, uh, and I encourage you to, otherwise you're going to be stuck with my questions. Uh, but with that said, um, over the course of your presentation, you draw these really powerful um, connections across these two different sort of previously, I think, separate corpi of material, right? I mean, like, we're getting often retrospective views of uh, slavery and serfdom um, by created by either, you know, uh, Russians or Americans about their own history, recent history, that is. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there are occasions where that connection is made for you, where a, you know, a, say an abolitionist points to Russian serfdom and evokes that in support of his or her cause? That's a good question. So thinking about maybe transnational images, not just in a comparative sense. Um, exactly. I th I've seen, you know, thinking about my archival research, I probably saw more uh, American images that influenced the Russian images than the reverse. Hmm. Um, and some notable examples include, you know, some ephemera, some advertising ephemera where you would see an African-American couple um, doing the kick walk or the cake walk as mm -hmm. it was written in Cyrillic. Um, you know, nothing like directly uh, referring to serfdom or slavery, at least in the visual imagery of the period. But um, if you don't mind me describing one notable example um, from the book, I didn't show it today. But one of the most striking and surprising images um, that I found in all of my research was in an archive in um, Moscow. And it was of a poster of a Russian peasant depicted as kind of like a, uh, a country bumpkin. It's an advertisement for cigarettes. So this country bumpkin in 12 different scenes, um, first he arrives in the city and he, through the course of the poster, it's a story, right? He becomes assimilated as an urban peasant and starts to smoke this company's cigarettes by the end of it. But what's really striking is the way that he's visually represented. At the beginning, he has black hair and a large nose and like very large lips. Uh, I would even say kind of like what racist characters of African-Americans looked like at the, at the same time in the American context. Mm. Um, and by the end of the um, poster, this peasant has blonde hair and a very small nose and small lips. And so mm. I talk about this in the book as kind of this idea of um, these physical, ethnic, or racial differences that are socially constructed by the artist to show uh, that these former serfs, like until they assimilate into Western Russian urban life, they are even perceived by, you know, these upper middle class Russians as being racially or ethnically different. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting, and I, I mean, it's surprising to me that there isn't a little bit more cross-pollination so it's sort of unidirectional there you know and I'm thinking about and this is sort of outside the purview of your project because you're post-emancipation but in the you know late abolitionist late antebellum period in the U.S. South I mean there's a popular pro-slavery trope of you know the industrial north it's a different kind of slavery right mm -hmm. point to mm -hmm. industrial England even so sometimes they look across the Atlantic and they would find a model in England and say you know this is even worse but at least in the south you have a benevolent slave master right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and, and and so it's it's surprising to me that um either pro-slavery writers or those nostalgic for uh, you know pre-emancipation South don't point to the sort of uh, experience of serfdom and some of that sort of favorable imagery mm. and draw a comparison in some way. Well, one, you know, one source that you probably know well, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin actually mm -hmm. was a big crossover source, influential source in the pre- uh, abolition era. And so some of the Russian writers like Turgenev um, got their hands on a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin when it mm -hmm. came out. Um, and they definitely drew comparisons to the situation of serfdom in the United, uh, serfdom in Russia with that of slavery in the United States. And um, John McKay at Yale wrote a great book um, called True Songs of Freedom. And it's all about, uh, it's all about the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin when it was written. But then what's super interesting is how 
that book, um, which made a big splash in Russia as it did internationally, also was even used during the Soviet era, right? Mm. Um, in the war of words and political ideas um, to uh, shape Russians view of the United States in different ways. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that, I mean, bringing up Uncle Tom's Cabin, you know, I mean, the extremely wide circulation of that text, thanks to new technologies, and, um, you know, a, a, a different print culture, I think, is integral to understanding how this does sort of travel in one direction, because I'm sort of imagining, and you can tell me if I'm totally off base here, that um, texts that are published in Russia probably just aren't circulating as widely. Well, remember also that Russia had was an autocracy mm -hmm. and um, had a strong print censorship culture. So censors oh. would prevent, you know, outside works from coming in and being circulated and also present, uh, prevent, um, you know, works critical of serfdom, for instance, from being published even in Russia. Mm -hmm. um, so one kind of interesting difference that we see in kind of uh, literature that was talking about slavery and serfdom, even in general, right on the eve of emancipation, I talk about this in my first chapter, um, is the idea of narratives written by serfs and mm -hmm. narratives written by people who would escape from slavery. So there were, I think, more than 100 um, slave narratives published in the United States in the late 19th century. And there were only 19, I think, that are known that were published by, I might even, that might even be too many. Um, John McKay actually has also translated four of those into English, making them like very unusual and accessible examples of kind of something that you could compare to the American slavery experience um, in the Russian context. You know, just, just, just sort of wading into the methodological weeds here, you know, because it's fireside chats and we uh, could do that sort of thing. Like, why not? how did you settle on the post-emancipation period? Great question, um, great question. I think, well, like you said, there were so many advancements in print culture and especially um, printing images in that period that there were just naturally, I think, more sources. Um, I did come to this comparison though through the literature, um, through that nostalgic literature written by Southern, uh, Southern white Southerners and then comparing that to some of the literature written by um, Russian authors. But the topic just grew from there, you know, looking at lithographs, I mean, advertisements, right, just exploded during the late 19th century, um, illustrated periodicals. So there were just so many things to look at that it it was, um, that's why I ended up focusing in that period in part. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, it seems like you are focused on sort of the visual culture um, pretty heavily here. And, and so if we're thinking about, I mean, yes, you have lithographs in the late antebellum period, but I mean, like periodicals really do take off around, what is it, the 1850s, 1860s? And remember in the, and actually it's a, in, in the Russian case, right? The images, the technology comes later. So mm -hmm. we're not really seeing images, for instance, I'm just thinking back now to the archives. I don't think I was really seeing images in newspapers until the 18, after the 1860s. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was earlier in the US. Yeah, but I mean, not by much. I mean, you've got like your Harper's Monthly, but I mean, that's really late 1850s, early 1860s. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, that's that's a trove for someone interested in, uh, in a visual culture. Um, so you're, you're dealing with sources that are being published in both English and Russian. Um, I trust that you have a background in Russian. <laughs> Well, I had to I had to develop a background in Russian yeah. for you know going abroad. So I I started learning Russian in graduate school and oh, that man. immersive experience, right? You really you're forced to adapt quickly and learn quickly. But the tricky thing about um, the Russian sources is that they're written in like a uh, an older form of Cyrillic. So uh. it was a unique challenge for me to first learn Russian language and then learn, you know, how to read and write Russian and then to learn how to turn the older Cyrillic into the, so it was kind of like a two-step translation process. And what what uh, sort of archives did you draw upon when you were in Russia? Um, there, are many, there are many interesting places to go. They have um, the Russian National Library in St. Petersburg, which has in different, different locations, um, 
some newspapers, um, advertisements, you know, a lot of the visual culture as well in different collections. And then um, the major museums have these fantastic, like not only collections of paintings, um, but also the archives of the different um, artists. So the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow has a fantastic archive and um, the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg has a wonderful archive. So um, they have some very robust archives in Russia and very lovely archivists who um, are so wonderful and helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I see that we have a couple of archive rats, at least a couple in our attendees here. Oh, good. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm curious to know if you could talk a little bit about like the experience of using, say, that Russian National Library in St. Petersburg versus, say, the Library Company or American Antiquarian Society. Like, how is that experience different as a researcher? That's a great question. I've never been asked that question before. Um, and it's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really a learning experience. I bet. Access is a little different. Um, it just, I would say like, it takes a little longer to get your materials. Like it could sometimes take a week or two to um, receive something that you have asked for. Whereas uh, at somewhere like the library company or the American Antiquarian Society, it might take, you know, within the same day or the next day. Um, and then there are also more stringent rules about um, copying and photography in Russia. So mm -hmm. it's very hard to, uh, you're not really, you're not allowed to take out your phone and just um, photograph things. So oftentimes I would have to transcribe and then translate later. Yeah, I mean, that, that was sort of commonplace here even 15 years ago. So I mean, like, it's, it's relatively new that we've become more permissive. And even for those of you who have come to the library company, if you're photographing in the reading room, Connie will zip on by and give you a little ruler that says library company so that you can recall that your uh, reference quality image is associated with our collections, which I mean, when, when I was a fellow, I found that actually very helpful because yes. for anyone who's done a lot of archival work, you photograph furiously, and sometimes you forget exactly what you're, you're, you're photographing or where you photographed. <laughs> Absolutely, it's a really it's a real balance that um, you know places like the library company probably have to manage. You know how much of your collection do you digitize? How much you know because you want people to come in the doors and be you know using the materials, right? Um, but then also this question of you know what really amazing things do you want everyone to see just by searching on the computer as well? So I'm sure you to think about those questions. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, one thing that we're always thinking about here is, you know, it's one thing to make it available and make it open access, which we've now had for a couple of years, which I think is a great step in the right direction. But then there's the question of discoverability. Like, how do you make it easily mm. capable? Yes. And so often what you, you, know, you find is if you're not using the exact right search term, depending upon the search engine you're using, or if you're in a right. specific repository, it's just hard to find it. Um, and I wonder if in Russia, because the state is such a bigger factor in people's day-to-day -day life, there is more sort of standard sharing across institutions? Mm. Maybe not. I don't know. And then, then, you know, some of the organizations that I'm talking about too, just have absolutely enormous archives, you know, on a government level for the whole massive country, right? Um, so different, you know, different questions for those companies. But I, I the, but I am, um, I really, I found the archivists in Russia to be so kind and helpful. Um, and I had a great experience overall there. So um, we're, we're coming towards the end of our time, but you know, I always love to, to sort of let people think a little forward. And I'm curious to know, and it's probably premature because you just published this book uh, and you're probably like ready to take a breather, but <laughs> Do you have another project that you're starting to cook up? I do. Um, I'm working on a book project about the history of US exploration um, and trying to um, share the stories of a more diverse group of explorers than you typically think about when you think about exploration. So um, what role women played, African-American explorers, Native American explorers played um, from about 1800 to the end of the 20th century. So working Ooh. on that. That's, 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 that's a good size span right there. <laughs> well, thank you. I um, certainly hope that we can entice you to come back to the library company and use our holdings. I've been told, in fact, I know uh, that we have, you know, a good amount in the 19th century for you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. All right.
Well, uh, thank you, Amanda, for sharing this book. Uh, and thank you for all of you for setting aside a little bit of your Thursday night. Um, I'll see you same time, same place next week. Take care, Amanda. Thank you. Good night.